Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 68, Design Deconstruction 2, Wings and Things. Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. I am glad to have you here on this wonderful Friday afternoon. Uh, one more time from the home studio before I probably retire the home studio for a while. Uh, but you know, here's hoping that we can uh, at least enjoy our time in the old home studio one more time before we start getting back to being in the uh, brilliant and brilliant studios every day. But on that note, we are going to talk about a lot of cool stuff today. We're going to get into a specific design because it actually uh, coincided with some questions I got recently about how to construct, honestly, a graphical bird wings for uh, different sorts of elements for, and I'm gonna fix my camera here, which has drooped a little bit, sorry folks. Um, We've had, I had some technical difficulties earlier that I'm dealing with now in the home studio. Uh, but we had some issues with people want, wanting to figure out how to put together bird wings, how to carve, in, in essence, to carve anything, really, how to separate items into uh, individual embroidery objects. And there was quite a lot going on in that space. So I thought, you know what, I would actually show you a design that I've worked on, talk a little about art preparation, uh, and honestly, talk a little bit about things that uh, I tell you to do that I should have done better myself <laughs> and discuss just in general. How do we put things together? And uh, with the design deconstruction, we'll actually replay some pieces of designs. We'll show you some things that are there. Um, not as much live digitizing, something I do want to do at some point soon, but uh, up until the point of at least showing you a little bit of the history of how I do wings and uh, what I think about it. Because it's uh, I am not a primary, like I'd say, an animal digitizer by any means. And it's, a lot of my stuff is not realistic. It's mostly graphical, but people do tend to like the way that I handle wings. So with that, hopefully I can help you handle those and also just discuss, like I said, in general, uh, art preparation, how to break up images, how to do that kind of stuff, uh, how to handle when you have an obscured image or images that don't exactly do the job for you. So what I'm hoping is uh, everybody will get something out of that. It's going to be a shorter show today for sure. As you guys may know, I have a big class coming up tomorrow and we've been very busy for uh, in the Brilliance world as well. So uh, maybe a shorter show, but hopefully it's something that will still give you something to uh, enjoy for today and to learn from. But in any case, if you have questions, if you have anything you want to talk about, whether it's particularly related to this or not in the embroidery world, the digitizing world, please go ahead and jump in, chime in with your questions, uh, with your questions, your comments, with whatever you want to say about what's on screen and off. And I will absolutely try and get that to you and get to a discussion of those things as much as I can. Uh, like I said, a lot of what I've done, though I have done some realistic bird work and some realistic animal work, uh, much of what I've done is graphical. As we all know, uh, many, especially in the U.S., where the eagle is on everything, we have lots of raptors, lots of birds that are uh, also have state birds, things like that, where I, there are a lot of wing shapes. Primarily what I'm going to talk about today is like raptor bird wings. There's the stuff that's on badges. Eagles is the big deal. So here's hoping like uh, that this is something that you guys will have a chance to use but if nothing else, we'll talk about breaking things up. I'll talk a little bit about the art process as well as we go into it. And if you guys didn't actually get to see this, um, I don't have a link yet for it. I realized I didn't throw this in the links list. Maybe I can uh, get uh, Jeff or Justin to hit me up with this link. I actually was on their live last night with the Embroidery Nerd uh, talking about art prep. And uh, Justin had a lot of great things to say about that. Justin and Jeff, we talked a lot about different kinds of art preparation. And uh, that also kind of tails into what we're talking about here, some of the things that we have to do to make art work work for us. So let's go ahead and uh, see how people are in the comments real quick. We'll check in with everybody and then we'll get into some of the topics here. And like I said, shorter show today, more to the point, but definitely want to touch on some things about, particularly about digitizing, breaking up shapes, and then specifically about dealing with wings. I know it sounds like something maybe you wouldn't do all the time, but if you're anyone who's doing with badges, doing military, uh, police, any sort of stuff like that, especially in the US where we have tons of eagle crests on everything. If you're doing any sort of schools, mascots, where you're going to run into hawks and eagles and uh, various permutations on the raptor bird, then hey, some of this wing stuff would be interesting to you, hopefully. And if nothing else, like I said, we're going to talk about how you adapt and work through art somewhat as we get going. So let's go ahead and say hi to everybody who's in the chat. We have Curtis Hello in from Kansas. Hello, Curtis. Happy to have you here. Yes, is in from Sweden. Yeah, happy to have you here as well. Hi. We have Frank over in the UK. Good evening, Frank. Hopefully you get some rest when you need to, sir. Uh, Fanny saying hello and good evening. Good evening to you as well. 
I'm Justin Armenta, digitizer of J Digitizing, who, like I said, we were on last night with the em the Embroidery Nerd. Uh, that was a good one. So good afternoon to you, sir. Uh, Brian Bailey, creative and brilliant. So you'll be seeing a lot of me working in the software today. Uh, he, he says, happy Friday. Happy Friday to you as well. Uh, Lori is in from New Hampshire. Glad to have you in here, Lori. Uh, Jeff Fuller of Fuller Embroidery Works, and who will also be uh, my co-panelist in Impressions Fort Worth coming up. Look for that later on this year, much later on this year. So yeah, we'll be doing some stuff uh, on the Madeira panel for uh, excellent embroidery. So we'll be talking about that stuff. Uh, and we have Fanny's in. Hopefully you won't have technical issues. Hopefully you won't. <laughs> Cindy says, good afternoon. Sorry, I won't be able to attend the weekend class. And it'll be fantastic. Well, thank you. Here's hoping. I will try and make it valuable for all you folks. And as we always do with uh, the decorators community, if you don't think you got your value, you always get full refunds. And honestly, I will do everything I can, whether it's in the Q&A or the class, to give you your value. So hang out and ask your questions after the fact. Uh, all right. Carol Wilson says, I made it in from Oregon. Glad to have you here. Uh, and Kathleen says, hi there. And Justin came through for me here. Thank you very much. In the comments, if you didn't get to see that live last night, here it is, uh, M Nerd with Eric. Uh, and also, if you are on my YouTube page right now, you will also find it under the... Um, under a, I have a playlist of like my guest appearances that are that's on my YouTube channel, and you will find the YouTube link to that also in the guest appearances playlist. So check that out when you get a chance. And then uh, Jan says, when in Fort Worth, and I'm actually going to look this up. So I'm going to share my screen because I, I can do that while we're here live. <laughs> and let me see if I can grab that for you. Impressions Fort Worth is coming up. There we are, September 10th through 12th, 2021. And as you can see right now, they only have me listed for uh, elements of excellent embroidery, but you're also going to find that uh, I'm listed for specialty thread, hopefully. I mean, I saw, I've i signed the contracts. Hopefully, they'll update the site. <laughs> so that's the plan. I'll be there in Fort Worth. And as you can see, this is hosted by uh, Madeira USA. Um, I use lots of threads, but I do love the Madeira stuff. And Sam Young will be there. And there he is, Jeff Fuller in the comments and on the stage with me when it comes out to a Fort Worth in September. So here's hoping everything goes well for that, folks. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, get back to what we're talking about here today. Like I said, uh, going to be a shorter class, but I think to the point, and a lot of you guys really have asked me to go back to doing some design teardowns to talking about technical stuff and digitizing as well. I like to mix everything in. Last week, we talked about trade shows, stuff like that. If you were uh, with us previously, we've had everything from sales and marketing and value through every manner of digitizing and embroidery stuff. Also, for those of you who've been asking for a repeat on fonts, for repeats on small details, that stuff's coming up. So I will do some, some uh, extended versions of some of the earlier stuff. I know that I can't always do new topic every time. Sometimes you want guys want to get back into a topic we've done before. Rather than always watch the old shows, you can always come back and we'll do some new topics as well. And that is so awesome to see. Happy Friday from the Madeira USA team. Thank you guys, especially after uh, talking about the show that we're going to do that imp for impressions. So yeah, the uh, the panel should be fun. <laughs> but these guys are awesome. The, the team over Madeira USA is great. They've been doing a lot of videos. They showed their uh, product line recently. It was really cool go check out all the cool stuff they have. I will say uh, what I've really loved is all of the various and sundry options and finishes that you can get over there. And also like I'm teaching the uh, emblem class tomorrow morning, um, lots of options for emblems. I get a lot of my stuff from Madeira USA. So if you're wondering, that's where I get a lot of my stuff from. Um, we'll talk all about that stuff tomorrow and <laughs> throughout, I'm sure. Jan also saying, awesome. Hopefully I'll be there. Yeah, hopefully you'll be there in, in Fort Worth. And also you'll get to see Jeff. Like I said, Jeff and Justin will be there from the Embroidery Nerd, and that should be really fun times. So uh, yeah. All right, folks. There's We'll talk more about shows that are coming up and everything at the end of the show. You know, I usually do that. But for now, let's go ahead and just let you know there is the links list as usual. I'm going to grab the link for it right now and throw it in the comments for you. If you're watching this live in the comments, you'll see this, but also we'll go ahead and put a banner up on screen for you as well. So this is the current links list. We've got some of the stuff that is that is familiar to you. It's stuff that we've done previously. I'll go ahead and show it on screen as I often do. A um, little bit about stitch types and machine embroidery. What I'll actually say, though, I've got that on the top of the links list. If we get down to the bottom here, you're going to see I just did a piece for Images Magazine out in the UK where I talked about these stitch styles. Again, they wanted me to go back to the basics and get people on board with uh, stitch angles and stitch types and the kind of surfaces we can create with that. So you'll find that in the links list. 
A uh, nice little article put together with folks at Images Magazine UK. If you like the magazine layout, and I often do, they have some great stuff there. Uh, some of some of the stuff that we talked about earlier with stitch types and the videos, uh, episode 36, episode 22, developing an eye for machine embroidery, great for art interpretation, something that uh, certainly we'll touch on today as well. And as we go through here, you're going to see that there's some other cool stuff. There's some dimensional digitizing stuff that I talked about previously. And here at the bottom, we actually have a guide to drawing wings. And we'll talk about that again later. But you can see here, uh, it's, it's actually a guide. I'm not expecting you guys to become wing artists. You're not going to become like uh, wildlife sketchists out here by doing this stuff. What I am showing you is there are some great resources out there for artists that can at least help us develop an eye for uh, wing structures when we're trying to figure something out. Oftentimes, we're going to be working from art that is suboptimal. We're going to be working from art that we can't really see shapes in. And if we want to make more than a fill slab with some lines on it, or if we find that a lot of our lines are occluded or fuzzy or look terrible, the ability to go to reference like this reference or like uh, this reference here that's uh, I'll have to show you guys from uh, DeviantArt. An artist on DeviantArt that put this up to show us. And it's just lovely how it's broken down. We've got feather groupings broken down. We have a dorsal and a ventral, so a back and a front, if you want to call it, side. So the chest side and the back side of the eagle's wings here or of an avian wing. So looking at that kind of stuff can help us do this work that we need to do. So in any case, uh, out now, New Images Magazine article, which does cover some of the stuff that we've covered before. But if you like it in article form, that's there. Otherwise, you can grab the links list. And there are the previous videos, episodes where we talk about the basics of stitch types, the basics of, of learning to develop the eye for embroidery, uh, seeing everything as embroidery as we look at it. So there's that stuff going on. So we'll, let's go ahead from that and let's start in on the topic of wings, right? Wings and digitizing and art prep and the whole bit. I mean, there's a lot that's going into that stuff. So hopefully uh, it will not only be specific, but help you to kind of think about your art prep in general. And what I'm going to show is actually a piece that uh, I did recently. And I'll be honest and say, sometimes you do a piece and it's not uh, what was expected. Or you have to work on it differently, but I'm just going to talk about this piece anyway. There are certainly some lessons to be learned about making sure you've got the right art source before you get going. But I'm going to show you some art source and discuss how I came to the piece that I did end up working through. Uh, and we'll go ahead and get into software for a good portion of that. But I will also just talk in general about uh, you know, wings and designs in the same kind of vein. So I will go ahead and bring up, however, the, on screen, the piece that I'm going to be talking about in general. And this is the actual piece itself, right? This is a, a Duesenberg. It's a car. If you guys don't know what a Duesenberg is, it's not important. But this Duesenberg badging was uh, inside a Duesenberg vehicle, as you may know. And this is a very standard kind of uh, simple rendition, I would say fairly simple rendition, of that badging, which was really a metal badge piece. So it's very similar to other kinds of badging or trophies. If you have done stuff, like I said, tons of stuff for police, tons of stuff for uh, military will have these kinds of um, pseudo metallic relief carved eagles or birds on them. But this is the piece that I'm specifically talking about. Before we do anything else with it, I will literally just run you through the replay. I always like to kind of show replays on designs. Um, this was intended to work on a hat, so it is going to play semi-centered out. You'll see that I've had to make some concessions for layering for uh, for the for essentially to get the kind of um, the kind of dimension I want to get to make sure that the chest, the central portion of the eagle, is on top of the wings to get the tail in the background. Uh, and I already have a question here. Carol Wilson is saying, what size is that? And I'm going to actually go ahead and tell you directly what size it is. This is a little wide, but it is made for, uh, it is in, in essence made for a wide cap front. And I can also explain why it's wide compared to, uh, compared to how you might otherwise handle it. Uh, but let's go ahead and grab the entire piece if I can get my mouse to behave for me. Uh, <laughs> See, this is why I often don't do things live, folks, because I've got too many things running and it's acting up. And I also don't have pointer focus running, so I'll have to grab that for you guys. But we'll go ahead and just grab this, and I will select it and let you know our, our complete design sizing here. It's about a little over five and a half inches wide, about five and a half. So actually 140 mils, I usually work in metrics, so that's what the size is on the finished piece. So this is a wide piece. But here, there is a reason for that, because this is a, a modified piece of art coming from another 
uh, from another digitized piece from another cap that was provided as one of the art sources. I'll show you a little bit of that later. However, there was a complaint that it wasn't realistic to the actual pieces that are on the vehicle. And part of that scaling was probably done in order to try and make this thing work for a cap. And as you can already see, there are some definite uh, compromises that have happened because the original piece looks more like this. And this is a, a piece that I actually looked up. I'll show you the art that I started from so we can discuss the, the kind of dangers of dealing with whatever art is provided for you. But this is the art that I looked up. I managed to find online that there was a museum that had badging from the Duesenberg cars. And when I looked at that, I'm like, all right, this piece, though I will say, yes, you're saying, all right, great amount of detail on this. And that does help you to figure things out. But Often when we're dealing with things that are like this, that are reflective, you can see, and I'll go ahead and kind of scan in here so you can look at it. Trying to decide where to drop a line when the styling you're looking for is less colored, is not shaded, can be difficult. Trying to find exactly where you want your lines to go. And also if you're trying to do this for production, dealing with the fact that you may not uh, really want to draw every little single feather that's in here, or when you look deeply into some of these areas, uh, the lines really are obscured or are somehow not part of the rest of the way this is put together. And in this particular piece, it has molded lettering that has this kind of border on it. And I particularly didn't think that the border was going to function very well to try and do this, as you can see in the center here, this molded impression of this lettering. I thought, you know, not exactly what I want to do, especially not on a cap size and also not on a dad hat, which was essentially what this was here. And with the two kind of uh, guiding principles being two images, which I'm going to show you, um, let's go ahead and grab those. The two images that I had when I first initially started this were this image. So this is right out of one of the vehicles. But as you can see, it is off center. It's kind of the lighting is not awesome, but it's there. You can get something out of it, certainly. Looks a little different from the other one. So one of the problems we're already having is the images don't match. Like they're not going to match exactly. And the other images I had really didn't match. And the online images were not awesome that I could find for this particular badge. This badge is a different shape. And the thing is that um, a lot of that branding wasn't necessarily so tight in the era of the Duesenberg. You may not have the same branding on everything. You may not have the same look. So here is one of the pieces here. I mean, you can get a fair amount of detail out, out of it, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't awesome. And honestly, when I was looking at it, there were some reasons I didn't really want to go with this particular piece of art. But then the other piece of art that was provided was this. And this is kind of a crumpled picture of a hat. I mean, it's not a terrible picture of the hat, but this was one of the things say, that was brought up after the fact as, okay, here's one of the ways that, you know, we've had it uh, interpreted that's good. Now, the, the hat picture has a fair amount of detail in it, but as you can see, um, when we get into here, kind of mush. You know, you're not going to get a lot of detail necessarily about what's going on in here. And if we look at this piece here, we can see that there's some defined feathers up in the right-hand corner. I'm going to go ahead and grab pointer focus. You can see my pointer a little bit better here, folks. Like I said, had a little bit of uh, technical issues when I first started up here today. So here's hoping I can get pointer focus. There we go. As you can see that on this particular image, and I mean, we can zoom in pretty well. And this image is not bad, though it's off kilter, a little off center. And the text on it the real enamel text that was done on this is pretty rough. So if the customer is expecting straight text, I'm gonna have to fight my way through the fact that this text literally is not very straight. The line widths, if you see the uh, stroke width in here and the E versus the B, how different those stroke widths are, um, as much as you can forgive it in this molded piece, when you're looking at somebody's embroidered work that they've done fresh for you, new for you, it might not be as acceptable. So using this as my original art was not exactly what I wanted. It was a little bit too, uh, a little bit too varied, a little bit too uh, raw for me as far as trying to get text out of that that I thought would look good. And for me, uh, font matching, when this is definitely not a font, this is not a font in any way, shape, or form. This was something that was hand-lettered at that period of time uh, and certainly is not something I'm going to find in a font the way people are kind of expecting it. There's no point to look for a font for this piece. So I'm looking at this thinking, all right, I need something that's a little more regular this enamel work in this S is too rough. And maybe if somebody was trying to do a historical reproduction of just this one badge, that's one thing. But then given that we also had this uh, given to me as a potential kind of source of you know information as to what it could look like or should look like, I'm seeing that we've got some differences here that have to be dealt with. And certainly, uh, as you can tell, very different levels of detail. We look here and we've got some definite feathers up in here. We definitely have some flight feathers that are shown distinctly, primary feathers on the wings. We've got some texture in the tail. Uh, we go over here and we just kind of have curly cues.
these are our fluff. They're not really made to look very much like feathers. And then over here, you can see that we've got a very big difference here, even uh, discounting the warping that happens in this image because it's kind of a crumpled image of a hat. We see that this is very different. Also, first thing I noticed, I'm looking at this and realizing, look at the horizontal aspect of this. This piece is very wide and short. We can also see that the eight on the bottom is coming off of the tail. It does not inca get encapsulated inside of the tail. Uh, and like I said, very wide, shorter, very horizontally aspected piece. Go back to this other piece that was also provided, much narrower, uh, and it has a much more kind of, uh, it's a little more squat in that in the width, in the horizontal. It's definitely been dragged in horizontally to try and make it fit on a smaller kind of cap area. So for me, I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to have to compromise. I've got this wide rendition of it. And also I've heard from the customer in, in question, uh, they do this incorrectly all the time. The number doesn't look right. And I think, and so I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here is we can see here that this number is, is encapsulated inside of the wing and the wing looks, or the into the tail. The tail looks kind of strange because it is kind of puffed up and inside of the rest of this and it's been made larger. So we've got this big spatulate tail. Whereas in here, yes, the tail is fairly large. It does have kind of a spatulate wide flat appearance, but it cuts just inside of that eight. It is not going all the way across that. So we're already kind of saying we've got two styles here, right? The two styles I have are this metal badge style. And then I have this embroidery style, which is a two color, fairly simple piece that is classy. And honestly, that's a classy look. Um, though what it does have going on that I, I didn't necessarily agree with is we've got a big, uh, thick border on it that doesn't seem to match any of the pieces that I'm looking at. And then it, when we're looking at this piece versus that piece, um, certainly very different uh, looks, and I would say even different renditions of the eagle's head, different renditions of the shape. The wing shape is very different. So what I decided to do was try and get myself a clean picture of some of the badging from the car. Um, and certainly I did some other things to it, like, like we often do. I wanted to see how the aspect was going to look on this piece. And I did what I sometimes will do, which is I did a mesh warp on it so I could get a straighter look. Now, I'm not going to go through the process of mesh warping everything, but we have the entire piece selected. I've clicked mesh warp. I'm in, um, I'm in Affinity Photo right now, but there's various kinds of mesh warping you could do in whatever way you need to. Whatever software you're in will have some sort of warp. And I'll go ahead and actually get back out of the warp so I can do this. Let's say I drop a guideline here and say, all right, I'm going to drop this guideline right at the tip of this wing so I can kind of see what's going on. Yes, there's some rotation. Maybe I'll mess with that in a minute. But for right now, I just want to see maybe if I warp it a little bit, can I see more of what it would look like straight? And so if I had everything, uh, and for some reason it's not grabbing it here. Let's go ahead and let's select that one more time. Uh, I don't have the right uh, layer here. But suffice it to say, I grabbed, I've got it all selected. I grabbed my mesh warp. And there we go. I start to warp it a little bit and say, all right, so I can get the tip here. I can kind of play with how straight these lines are. And yes, I'm, I'm changing the width a little tiny bit, but I'm going to adjust for that. And I can get just a better idea of what this thing looked like straight. Am I going to be able to use this for art? Absolutely not, because I still have curvature that's involved. But it does give me a little bit better look at this thing straight, because I'm going to bring it in as reference. I will often take an image that I can't trace or draw over and still bring it into the software as reference to help me figure it out. So these were the initial two pieces of art that I had. I then decided, like I said, to go looking for a better piece of art. And in that case, that's when I found this which once again, it is badging from the vehicle. So it is real badging produced in the time. It has the correct look. I can see that the eight is where it's supposed to be. And so I've decided to use this as my primary rendition, uh, expecting that that straight eight logo was what we were trying to do. Now there's other, there, it turns out there's some other variations on the Duesenberger logo. So, you know, when you're working with a customer, don't just go ahead because you want to get something done. Make sure you have everything worked out because there's multiple, as you see, multiple variations. And I kind of went out on my own and said, this is the art that I'm using as my, my source. A uh, better option by far is to make sure and have the art looked at by your customer, if at all possible. But this is something that I was doing kind of uh, as, a, as an exercise as well as working on it for someone. But as you can see, I searched for this art found this and in my book, looking at the two things that were provided as potential art sources, I'm thinking, okay, it looks very much like this piece aside from some of the outlining that's done on the text. And really, I think that it was functional and it was done primarily so that there's a good place to put that, um, to, to mess around with that particular um, 
medium. You've got enamel that's got to be dropped into a well here. And this is probably how this is really done. It's not printed on. It's enamel that's painted into those wells. So that has more to do with that than the look. And then looking at the other piece they had, which was flat like this, which also makes more sense for a smaller rendition that I'm not going to be trying to put all these borders on everything. I went ahead and went with this embroidery style, but with the art that was more akin to what we had in the badge. And uh, that's that's one of the things that you can do and work from. And actually I've got a comment here that I'm gonna bring up because Justin brings up a, a very lovely point here, which I will, I will discuss here quickly. And he says, uh, nice thing about symmetrical images, if you can straighten one side enough to work from, you can duplicate and mirror. Here's the one thing I'm going to say though about this piece. If you look over on this right-hand side and you look at the left-hand side, unfortunately, this piece isn't symmetrical. Uh, these flight feathers and the tips that are here, there it's not particularly symmetrical. And I decided that that might be important. In fact, if you look here, um, there is more fullness in this left-hand side. So you look here, these wingtips don't really match even when it's straightened up, even when I align the text. And there's some fullness here. There's some differences here, differences here as far as the wingtips. And you can certainly see that this is a little more hollow, this curve, this is a little more full. However, though it's not entirely symmetrical, what I'm gonna tell you is I did do some duplication and mirroring because it was still worth it, especially with a wing like this where they're very complicated to digitize the first time out. I mirrored it and then I realized what are the elements that are gonna be the most visible to our customer? Well, the things that are going to be visible to the customer are the shape of the wing itself, uh, any of these standout separated feathers, these flight feathers, these primary feathers are going to really stand out. Those are the two things that are gonna matter. Things that don't matter as much, the texture that's behind the text. Behind the text is not gonna be particularly visible. Do I need some texture in there? Certainly, do I need some outlining in there in the style that I was working on? Yes, but it doesn't have to be exactly what's shown behind this piece. And as we can see, there really, uh, there isn't that much that you can see. So what I did indeed do is I worked out the right wing first. I did flip and resequence. So I used all my pieces from there, but once I did the flip and the resequencing, I actually went back in edited the edges here because the silhouette, the outside edge of a thing is what is the most visible in a logo. It's also why many logos work fully in black and white because the shape and the silhouette is what's going to be visible. It's what's going to be uh, noticeable primarily. That first thing we notice is the edge of the shape. The first thing that's going to throw you off if it's not correct, which by the way, considering what was mentioned to me previously, the first thing that's gonna throw you off is not correct is that this was not right. If you look at that cap design, what threw it off? What made it look weird? What bothered them? Uh, a good portion of it? Because we had the number incorrect, or at least that's how I understood it. And with that number not looking correct, not being where they want it to be, not sticking off of the tail, the tail being weird, uh, certainly the aspect ratio of the wings being kind of strange, I'm like, all right, let's try and hit the aspect ratio much closer. But I will tell you, I know partially why this was done for embroidery. And I bet you any of you folks out there doing embroidery know this too. What's the first thing that you realize is going to be a problem? If you're looking at this piece at size, the first thing you know is going to be a problem for sure is this A. We're looking at this piece and the first thing I'm looking at, if I do this thing at size for a hat and I don't make any changes to the artwork whatsoever, this A right here is sub three millimeters tall. So trying to make that out of, out of satin stitches, especially if I'm going to do any sort of justice to the letter forms that are in there, which we do have serifs on these letter forms, uh, that's gonna be a problem. Also, I'm gonna admit, if you look at these pieces, when you have reflective metal pieces like this, look how quickly that the texture behind that text turns to just mush. I mean, yes, there are lines here, but trying to decide what inside of this oatmeal is a feather is not particularly easy all the time. So what the reason why I showed you guys uh, wing anatomy earlier, um, that wing anatomy can help you make decisions because one of the other things I did is once I got up past these flight feathers, I wholesale made decisions to deal with the secondary feathers and the transition up into, I mean, I don't think it's scapular feathers that are up here. I think that's on the back because it's like the scapula, like the uh, shoulder, the uh, shoulder blade is a scapula, of course. Um, but these feathers up here, and I'd have to look at what the ventral side feathers are called. I, I believe on the back it's like scapular feathers, but going in from these primary feathers into, the, into these secondary feathers, and I believe into some tertiary feathers that go up to the border of the wing, uh, I definitely decided what feather shapes I was going to go for and where I was going to put those lines. I did not worry too much about where they're going in here anymore. 
so long as I was close to the overall pattern of the wing. And the thing is, the customer's not necessarily going to see that either. If I was worried about this as a fully historical reproduction, maybe I'd be a little more concerned. Because it's going to be stylized to some degree, I'm not as concerned. So let's go ahead and go back up and look at the design itself, right? So here's the design as it, as it is finished. Uh, and like I said, in that simple style, and we can go ahead and hide the artwork from behind it, I believe here. Let's go ahead and hide our artwork so that it won't be selected anymore. So here is the actual piece as finished. This is what it looked like when I was done with it. So let's go ahead and pl play through it really quickly and you can see kind of how the structure's put together. Um, it's not a very detailed thing. I would say, yes, there's a lot of detail in the fact that I've done all the wing carving and satin stitches. This could be a big flat fill. You could do it if you wanted to. And you definitely could use elements of fill in here. And I'm gonna show you where I do. There are elements that are not carved. There are elements of this that are fill that aren't individually carved like of the rest of the flight wings. Once again, where are our important feathers in this wing? Along the edge where we're going to see the edge por portions where they're going to be very visible outside of the text. These big flight feathers, the wing tips here are going to definitely be visible, but under the text, not so much. Up here again, now these become visible again. Now the texture in these little winglets can be uh, you know, looked at differently, but under the main body, in the chest of the eagle itself, not going to be necessarily as visible. And that texture is going to get at least partially obliterated by the text that's going over it. So I'm not as concerned there. Tail is going to be fairly visible as well. And I've actually got a little bit more as far as these little ticking details uh, in the darker color in the tail as well. So what I'm going to say, this is not the most detailed piece on earth. This is not, you know, the most photorealistic, crazy shaded piece at all. This is a graphical piece. It is two colors with a text layout on it. But this little amount of detail in these colors with the carving will make this thing pretty lively as far as light playing over the surface. With that, let's go ahead and just kind of run through it. You can see this background already. And uh, let me grab that again. Oh, unfortunately, there we go. Wasn't responding for a second there. You can first see that I've done some layout. Those lines that are there are actually just guidelines that I drew so I could see what I was doing in, in the later piece. However, you can see that I've got uh, essentially this center out kind of global underlay that I'm using to hold down any sort of kind of soft crowned hat. Knowing that we're going on a dad hat, I wanna spread that hat out ahead of time, especially because I'm going to be working uh, through the piece in a way that's not entirely centered out, bottomed up. I am going to fill the center part of the chest last when we're doing that base layer. So I definitely wanted to lay that out first. And you can kind of see as we go through here, that it goes up, up to center. Now I could have also offset this and it depends on how I did it, depends on the hat that we're working on. I would offset this a little bit more off the seam, but this, the same kind of thing goes on. We use a tree type of format to get out to the edges of the wings. Once again, depending on the hat, I might not go right up the dead center of the seam because if we were dealing with a problematic hat, I don't really want to interact with that seam that much, but I do want a tree style set up to some degree. Uh, depends on the hat. For this one, soft, soft dad hat, not a big deal. Then you can see I'm just using really simple contour underlay and I am overlapping. You'll see how we have these individual shapes that are overlapped pretty deeply into the next satin stitch and we're rotating angle as we go through the, uh, through the feathers as we run on that. So um, Carol says, the area under the eight is small. Why didn't you fill, fill the area of the feathers under it? Uh, in this case, it's a little bit larger than you might think. I mean, we had we're working with eh, eight mils or something. So it's a pretty big area. I decided not to. Um, you wouldn't have to necessarily take it out, but when I'm overlapping lots of little wing winglets, less little feathers, uh, I decided to knock out the area of the eight. You could do with do it with or without. You probably would have been fine, but by the time I got done outlining and everything else, I decided I didn't want to have that all underneath there. Um, but yeah. I even thought about that because truth of the matter is once I have to go back and adjust the aid at all, you could end up where you might end up with uh, areas that I then have to reconstruct. I decided to knock it out because I was going to do a fair amount of work on this piece. Uh, and I didn't really want that extra bulk in that piece. But yeah, honestly, it was small enough that I really could have left that in. But as you can see, we start out with the flight feathers on the bottom here. Um, overlap them fairly deeply. All I've got is a contour underlay. I'm not trying to stack up a lot of like double zig underlay or anything else. I'm not trying to make it super, super dense, uh, but I do have a nice contour to make the edge hold out. Uh, and we're rotating as we go along. And essentially we're building up to these flight feathers. But what you're going to see is once I get into the secondary feathers, rather than doing individual feathers, now you can't. And I'm, I'm gonna show you other birds that I've done where I do do individual feathers in this secondary panel. 
this is the one place where I think you get away with fills pretty frequently. And in this case, what I've got here is a fill that's got some randomization in it. So if I were to turn on points, and I can do that in a minute here, you'd see that the stitch lengths are randomized so that we end up with a more natural look to it. And then on the top, the secondary feathers, I'm going to go ahead and carve those out again. And then we carve on that top edge, that top kind of leading edge of the wing I often will do in a series of small satins that allows me to get kind of a ridge on the top. And as you can see, if I go back to, and let me see if I can grab that, um, hope I can grab that pick where we talked about the uh, structure in the wing here. And that'll be over in our uh, browser here. We can grab that. If we talk about the avian wing, you can kind of see what we're talking about. That little tube area, that leading edge is uh, where we have this kind of set structure going on. Um, and certainly, if we look here, there's though we have it here fully filled in, it is kind of rounded. It has a surface on it, putting a satin stitch on that edge of some kind or some of an edge that way. Certainly you can work on feathering it in, depends on if you're on the back or the front, but I often use a satin that goes kind of transverse across this, you know, perpendicular across this in order to give it a ridge. And you'll actually find that in a lot of the um, badges and super graphical kind of treatments that those are actually drawn in with outlining as a ridge, as a border. So honestly, I usually do that even if the border is not express in the art. I will usually use a piece more like that. But you can see that's how that's put together. So as we as we go through that, essentially I've, I've done that on both sides. Now I'm going to go ahead and grab that one more time. We'll run that back here and uh, try and show that to you one more time. So we'll go fast run through the wings. We do still center out pretty well, but I do go back. As you can see, I travel down and start the second wing in the same way because I am sequencing it out. I certainly did start in the middle and work toward the outside edge on purpose, but there was a copy and paste here, but you can see that I have changed the shape of the edges of the wings and changed some of the feathers so that the carving and the alignment does look more like the badging where it isn't exactly symmetrical, especially when we're talking about uh, something like this, where I've got those edges, where it's on that silhouette, where it's more visible, then I'm gonna work on that. But if this were a standard badge, most of the time you will find uh, they are often um, symmetrical, especially when they've been drawn in recent days. So there's that top of the wing once again. We do have several sections here with a little bit of turned up area, and I'll zoom in on that in a second. But also, once again, I've used a curved fill for the central part of the body. And it just, once again, has a texture, a randomized texture of stitch lengths so that I end up with a little bit of, um, a little bit of a more natural organic texture in the chest. Also, the edges have been lightly feathered or made jagged. They're going to be outlined anyway, but I find that softness still comes through, even though I'm gonna outline that to a degree. Uh, having a little bit of jaggedness helps to break up any edges so we don't have a really shiny, satiny-like edge. So a little bit of feathering helps in that case as well as that randomization in that centerpiece. Then you'll see that I actually start to carve again. Once I get up into the neck of the, of the eagle, I'm going to carve those individual pieces. There's the lower half of the beak the eye, which I've done separately underneath kind of the brows, the kind of ridges of the cheek and the uh, the upper ridge of the head that's often separated in these, in these kind of uh, graphical treatments. And you'll see that once I fill in that I carve around the eye and I think I can go ahead and let's, let's zoom in on that so you can see it a little bit better. But we'll go ahead and take a look at the head and the pieces that are in the head. As we get up toward the top of the head, you'll see we're gonna carve through. There's our fill, we carve through. There's our curved fill for the body. And then as we move through this piece, we're gonna run back up. We're doing that same thing where we're carving the individual pieces that are in the art. There's the bottom of the beak. Then the eye ends up being filled in underneath it. And we're gonna go ahead and do the cheek pieces and everything else. So let me try and do a little faster than that. As we go through and you'll see that top ridge and then the beak, you see that the eye is now set down inside of that. The, the beak and what I would consider like the cheek are up at the top. This ridge on top is a little bit behind it. Definitely the bottom of the of the beak is also underneath that. So that is just that layering, like I've talked about many a time, that layering just happens to help uh, with that overall dimension. So as we go through that, you can see, you can get a little bit better look at the shadowing here, that we've got just a little bit of dimension here. It will get split up certainly by the outlining, but that does just kind of help us see a little bit of texture. But you can see in the central pieces here um, that the texture is 
you know, it is certainly uh, partially made with fills. It's it's not as textured under the text as it is in the edges, but I don't think that it suffers because the text itself is going to obliterate some of that texture. Uh, and once we get into the outlining, once again, outlining, zero trims, one filament of thread throughout, um, done in a very similar fashion. But the one thing you can see is that's actually useful to kind of make a study of when we're in this outlining, you can see that I've eventually ended up where when I don't have the detail in the art, in the mid body, in the secondary feathers here, and I don't really have a lot of detail, I've elected to use this very scale-like pattern or brick-like pattern. It's not exactly necessarily true to a real wing. Sometimes the feathers will be lined up right on top of each other, but rather than have it look like I've got little sections and have it look too much like stripes, what I've found is using this scale-like pattern, which is more in indicative of what you might see on like the chest, this, this pattern where the lowest point of this row of wings is bisected by the, the, the winglet underneath it, by the feather underneath it, um, that scale-like, brick-like pattern tends to be a little more, uh, I would say, a little more attractive from a distance. It breaks up those outlines and make it looks like, makes it look more like individual feathers than it does when you have the lines lining up too much. If they line up right from the bottom of the flight feather all the way to the top, it looks like you have big, long feathers and they look like stripes. Um, once again, this is where we're deviating from the art to a degree. The art doesn't really have that in a way that I can see it. And I'm also not going to try and represent every little uh, line that we have there. Not every little line. Okay, we have one more thing here where Carol's saying, uh, the fill at the point of the beak and the crown doesn't fill in the outline. Does it fill it stitch out? Yes. Push and pull. At the end of each one of these satin stitches, we're going to get some push. We're going to get maybe 0.2 mills of push at the end of every satin stitch. So at the end of these little things, at the end of the beak, at the ends here, gonna push out and we're gonna pull in. It's also, you'll see that we've got a little bit of extra here. I've actually looked at this in the sequence and it's gonna fill in. Uh, certainly there may be some adjustments to make depending on how it's shifting, but generally you're gonna wanna stop short in these areas before you get up to your outlines. You get a straight stitch outline that's really fine like that. If you butt them right together, what's definitely going to happen is the fill, the fill area, the satin that goes up to it will poke out beyond the outline. If they meet perfectly, the satin will go beyond the outline for sure. There's always push at the ends of satin stitches. There's always pull on the sides. So yeah, that will definitely be happening. But as you can see, uh, I have decided to, uh, so in here, in these areas, um, you can see that there, I've stopped a little short. Some of them are a little more than others. Some of that's due to sequencing where I, uh, I'm assuming that I've been running in one direction for a little bit and it's going to push out quite a bit. So I've got a little extra. But the truth of the matter is, at the scales that we're actually looking at, um, most of that's going to fill in. And if it doesn't fill in, then I would certainly check it out in the final stitch out and make sure it filled in. But pieces like this are largely going to fill in. Plus, uh, when we're zoomed out, these lines look very, very thin. The truth of the matter is, some of these thin lines, when we put those uh, two lines, because th this is a doubled straight stitch. This is not a single straight stitch line. Each line is exactly two passes of straight stitch two passes of straight stitch is going to be thicker than one. And where we have something where it comes down to a point, four lines of, of straight stitch coming together to a point are also going to fill in a little bit. So they're going to roll off of each other and fill in and get thicker. So yes, you're going to see a little bit more filling and that's why I stopped there. And you can see this texture in here looks kind of random and not the best, right? It doesn't look like it's incredible texture. Uh, not going to matter very much when it's obliterated by the text that's going over it. So for me, I'm just looking to pr produce enough texture to give you the sense of the texture that's here. And as you can see in the real piece, what are you gonna make out of it? You've got a couple little lines here that may be there, but I wouldn't consider that to be particularly strange if you don't see a lot of it. And you can actually see, I did look at the piece and where I have this very distinct line here coming off of that E, that distinct line actually is here. So when there is a very distinct line that you can see, I use it. When there isn't, a little bit of random texture will go a long way to making it look right. And in here, uh, you can see certainly there's not necessarily that much texture, but we do have a little bit of a, of a feather edge right here that can be seen off of the B. Well, off the B right here, a little feather edge between. Where the texture is visible, I'm using it. Where it's not, I'm letting my kind of general knowledge, which is not <laughs> exactly that of an ornithologist, the general knowledge of the of how a bird wing is put together, kind of let me see what's going on there. So in, in short, the things to take note of here that I think are interesting about this piece are certainly the carving aspects that we're, we're essentially using uh, individual satin stitch to carve the flight feathers, especially the real important ones are here. Um, a lot of this could have been done with Phil if you really wanted to. I find that this secondary area where we have kind of these fluffy ruffled feathers 
often can be used with a fill, especially when it's really small. In this case, I didn't do it because of that, but rather because I wanted a nice flat surface to run that text over. And I didn't want to be competing with a lot of the shine that I have from the satins necessarily. I wanted a little bit more buff texture there. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I would use that. Also, hey, for, for the sake of expediency, if you're just trying to get this piece done, uh, that also, because it does take a lot longer to draw individual feathers than it does otherwise. But once we have that outlined, once we have all the carving done, once we throw the text on top of it, we now see that the area that's visible under the text in that space is minimal. And the places that are exposed are all in the wonderful carved satins that make more sense of the piece. And seen more as it would be seen in life here, you can get an idea of, um, yes, I reduced some texture here. Yes, I made some what I would consider educated guesses based on uh, the general knowledge of what a, a wing looks like, but the piece is still satisfying in that when we look at kind of the original art here, we know that there's some lines, we have these flight lines, we do have the text here, we have the eight that is coming off of the bottom of this piece. We can see some feathers here. We have that ridge that actually is fairly well defined in this piece, as you can see. And when we look at the embroidered piece, we're getting a similar look. We have the defined ridge here. I did exaggerate maybe a little bit in these turned up tips that will pull in slightly. Uh, at least that corner will be rounded slightly when it runs. Um, certainly we've got the wing tips that are sticking out as they are here where we have a very slight difference in the shapes that's happening between the two sides. Little more fullness here, a little more hollow here. So it does still also look more organic like this particular piece really does. So, I mean, that's that's the concept. We're, we're taking the multiple pieces of art that we have that we started from, right? We're looking at the original pieces we had, got this piece, we warped it out and tried to look at it and said, all right, if this is this height. And in fact, that's the other thing I'm gonna tell you. In analyzing this piece, when I measure this, the height of this particular um, sample, when I take the relative height and look at it and say, okay, if I set this at the largest size that vertically I'd be comfortable with, for this dad hat, what does the rest of this piece look like? And what you'll find out is this text in here, the smallest text is just under five mils. So you can see how was this worked out? Well, obviously the person said, I'm gonna have to change this text to get to the five mils. And the other things you're gonna notice that I've changed uh, in the same boat here, uh, it's not even that noticeable from the from the get-go, but if you're looking at the, the piece as it is here, um, certainly, you can tell that I made some alterations. This text is smaller in general than this text, but how did I handle that? I minimized some of the space that was around it. I grew it vertically without doing too much horizontally so that I just got that A down to the point of the size that would work. Also, though it looks a little, it does look a little congested here before running, you can see that I've dropped out the crossbar here. And when I drop that crossbar down, um, these two, ends of the letter will still push down a little bit. So these two ends of the strokes will get a little bit longer. The crossbar will get a little narrower as it stitches. And in the end, what we'll get is still visible as an A. And the other thing you're gonna notice compared to um, the other piece that we had here, this piece, the, um, pardon me for doing that. <laughs> Accidentally grabbed that instead of, instead of scrolling here. But if we uh, look at this piece in comparison to this piece, uh, the character of the text was largely lost. Um, the original text had a very distinctive R, the S was more distinctive, the serifs were distinctive. This looks like kind of a Roman flair serif rendition. If we go down to see this piece, I'm still having the big slabby serif that was up here in the top of this. That leg on the R, which is super distinctive, is still there a very slabby kind of serif happening up here in the G as well. These things are present in the actual text. We have that slabby serif. We have that very particular uh, shape that S that has that uh, rise here as it goes into that wedge serif. Um, these things are symptomatic or endemic of this entire way of running this text. But the thing is they really do give it the look it has. Did I have to make more compromises down here? Absolutely, in the small text compromises had to be made for it to run correctly. However, um, when we're looking at the overall look, when we're looking at it from a distance, the things that make it point that point to it being um, point to it being the actual piece are these idiosyncrasies of the text itself. The fact that the S has that kind of squashed flat aspect and those serifs certainly. Um, if we're looking at the R once again, we're we're seeing that that R has that really distinctive leg. These things make it look like itself. 
if we remove that R, if we start to make it look like this, we now have a curve to it. It doesn't look like the original. And also there was just kind of some uh, quality issues as far as, you know, some pull comp issues, some other issues that were present in this piece that hopefully, like I said, I didn't get a chance to run this one out before we talked about it, but would be selected against as far as uh, what we did here. And certainly I'm being very careful about my stroke width here. So this should run well. You'll also see like the T looks very narrow. Well, once again, that satin stitch is going to push toward the outer edges. And as it does, I'm going to have uh, a longer bar. So with that, I'm going to just talk about some wings. Let's just kind of show you some different wings that I've done previously. So we'll show you both what I first saw when coming to my job and uh, what I started out from. And then we will talk about, you know, what else we will do essentially as far as uh, other kind of graphical styles and what it and what has been done. I've got one more question in here from Carol here. She says, uh, would you ever add the gold in the A after it was done? No, I would not. Um, that A will open up. Number one, it'll open up. And if it doesn't open up enough, certainly in the preview, it looks a little fatter than it's really gonna, gonna run, certainly. Uh, and as we zoom in on it, you'll see that if, if I measure this right now, the other thing I can tell you is if I, if I actually measure this piece, um, which I will, I'll do that live because I, I know what my measurements are gonna turn out. Like if I measure uh, the A here, oops. Pardon me, folks. If I take a look at the at the A as it is, and uh, hide that image back down. Okay, I'm frozen up. Sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> my machine is running a little hot. I have to turn my cooler off for the duration of the show, and I think maybe we're uh, <laughs> slowing down a little bit, and I've got too many things open. Uh, but that A should stay open at uh, at size. I'm going to go ahead and pop off of this. But yeah, that A should stay open at size. The um, Width of that is about 0.8 to 1 millimeter in width. That gap, as it gets a little uh, smaller, as the strokes thin out when they run by, again, that 0.17, to, depending, 0.13, 0.17 um, of a millimeter that's going to thin out, um, that should open up enough. And I wouldn't really want to add gold in the center of that. I wouldn't want to do that. Um, if if you absolutely had to, I guess you could fill something and add it on top, but that's an extra color change. And, and for production, that's something I would not want to add just to get a, a dot in there. Let me see if everything has uh, straightened back out here. Maybe I can uh, get back to the software and see what's going on. All right. Yeah, there we go. So in the software again, let me see if I can get my measurements going again. So I apologize for that, folks. But um I have a ton of stuff open, and I think that's probably what I have caused myself some uh, undue trouble here. So there we go. We're going to get back into the center of that. Let's go ahead and, and scroll back in. I'm going to measure, and from right here, if I look at that, oh, I've got my stuff on inches. We were talking about bigger measurements. I usually tell everybody other measurements that way. But as you can see on the bottom left-hand corner of my screen right there, that that distance is 0.9 millimeters. So just as I kind of expect, 0.8 millimeters to one, then yeah, I'm going to say that's going to stay open and I'm not going to have much trouble with it. Uh, also, Kathleen says, did you use 40 or 68 thread on this one? Um, this is something that I'm expecting to use 48 thread on. I wasn't going to rethread on this particular piece. I wanted it to run without any other issues. You could totally use 68 thread and go smaller by up to a, a quarter. But for this particular piece, I was doing it in a pretty classic style. And uh, underlaying letters, uh, manual underlaying letters, usually. I'm going to use straight manual underlay. Uh, or uh, contour just made quite thin, depending. Uh, this particular one, yeah, I would probably just manually underlay underlay these straight. Uh, just depends on on how I'm doing it. I think this one I actually used I used the contour made thin, which is a way to make a a center run that's pretty easy. And often, even in software that does uh, express center run, I have used contour underlay and just made the inset to where the underlay is right on the center line because sometimes it's actually more efficient then the path you get from saying center. I won't you know, call out which software I'm talking about, but there are softwares where I've found that you get a more efficient path by using the auto contour and then just making it thin rather than using what they will consider a straight line underlay. Some of those straight lines run back and forth, whereas the contour doesn't do it as much. Peculiarities of the engine when you use automatic stuff, uh, it's why I will often underlay something that's very small uh, manually. So yeah, it depends. Uh, in this particular piece, I planned it for using a 40 weight thread so I didn't have to make any changes on it and that the thread would be a single weight and kind of match what they had exist in the existing spot. Um, you totally could use 60 if you wanted to and just increase your density slightly and uh, you could go up to maybe a quarter uh, of the size smaller. But what I'm going to say is running on top of the textures that's, that are underneath it, I was happy to go ahead and run it with the 40. And yeah, you, 65 nine needle, you could use 60 thread, 60 weight thread if you want to. Um, this particular piece, I think it would run. I've got everything down to minimum sizes that I feel uh, okay with. 
But honestly, depending on what you've run previously, and I've got other pieces that we can actually look at the real pieces. Um, yeah, I don't think that that's real. This particular sizing is a problem. I wouldn't expect a problem on it. Like I said, I don't have this one run out to show you, but uh, certainly it's not something I would expect to be a problem. Let's go ahead and run just through some random wing stuff. I'm going to show you first. This is one of the first wings I ever saw. This is what a lot of people do. Uh, not really my favorite thing, and it's certainly not one of my pieces. Uh, fills, just big old fills. Can you do this? Sure. And every once in a while, you'll have a customer who likes it. This was done for um, APD, uh, Albuquerque Police Department, years and years and years ago. And this was on the system when I got to my job. Um, but, you know, it had some issues with it. You can see that there's some density issues that were happening in it because the software it was done in wasn't really treating that density very well. So it's got these this stripy nature to it. Also, because we've got a fill that has a bunch of these inset cuts on the end of the wings. And I'm going to tell you from having seen this piece run, um, because the fills are pushing on both sides to some degree, this thing was frequently escaping the outside edges of those particular pieces. So not something I would usually do. Um, and here's another piece that, uh, you know, it's a little risque piece, but it is a piece I got a picture of to show you. Very simple wing that follows after kind of the very first sets of wings I ever did. It doesn't look very nice, looks kind of choppy, but once again, at distance, once it's finished, looked just fine. Earlier piece of mine, but it's done in a very similar uh, style. We're using an overlapped satin on that edge there. We do have a uh, length limited, very wide satin that's going up here uh, that's split. Then, of course, once again, fill in this section. I don't always do a fill there. In fact, I often don't. But when we only have this much reveal and it's something that's very graphical, I don't see any problem with using a fill in this section. Plus, this was getting uh, outlined all throughout. And you can also see the tr classic military patch technique of using a light fill through here. Wasn't being done on a patch, but they wanted that sort of look because it's, uh, it's a little risque pinup grill scene that's here for the Knob Hill Bar and Grill. But it, it was done as a... Uh, kind of military style badging, paratrooper style badging. Um, certainly lots of the things. This is one of my very first sets of wings that I ever did with this setup. Once again, very similar technique, but in this one, I didn't use any contour underlay except for the outside edge because it's a smaller piece. Fill in the secondary, something like that. Very similar piece, um, but you can, but you'll see it used also. I've done this in, the, in a graphical piece, and this is a very small hat badge done for uh, New Mexico State Police aircraft. You can also see that I'm using some straight stitch text in here. Really small piece overall, but this is done two colors. So we got an olive drab colorway in here. And this one, I actually went with these secondary feathers carved. There weren't many. There wasn't a ton of detail in them. So rather than worry too much about them, I went ahead and carved them individually. And then we have this really wide kind of shoulder that's up at the top of it. When we're dealing with a graphical setup like this, where they're very kind of graphic, very abstract, um, I did use some more realistic little pieces in, the, in there, but at the same time, this was done mostly to get the text, and that's what we're saying right there. So, you know, that's usually how that is. Okay, Brian says about, I'm assuming about the Duesenberg logo. Again, we can go ahead and look at that. Uh, is the bottom of the eight going to push over the gold at the bottom of it? A consistent amount of build that would be important for a smooth curve. Just wondering if that's the thinking. Uh, no, I don't think there's going to be any issue of that eight pushing over the gold. I wouldn't expect it to. Uh, with the amount of bleed that I have there, I'm going to expect that it's fine. The amount of reveal that I have should be good. So I, I don't think that we're going to have that kind of problem because we actually have a fair amount of reveal in that piece. I'm going to say that's uh, if we're looking at it, we've got an extra amount of reveal here, but it is going to pull a little tiny bit. And I wanted to make sure that I had uh, enough to really cover that up. I don't want to be uh, interfering with it, but I did want a nice thick border on that for it to show. Uh, certainly looking at the rest of the pieces that are here, you have slightly less here, but it looks like there's less gold. But a lot of that is because we're dealing with an actual car piece with a shadow. This has been taken a picture of vertically, and we can see there's a dark shadow all along the bottom of this as well. So it's going to have a fair amount of that. Uh, I've got some reveal there that's maybe a little extra, but that's another thing where when we're dealing with the bottom of a cap seam, I'm going to really be very careful about not having uh, too little reveal on that as well. All right, so let's get back to some of the other examples just to kind of run you through it. Uh, pretty simple stuff, but we do have some more detailed kind of individualized pieces. This is another graphical piece where it's very rough. Uh, this Urban Legends piece was done um, essentially wing on a skull, but it has a similar look. You can see I've got some carving in the teeth on the skull, but then I've used some curved fills and I've used that once again, length limited satin for that jawbone. So we've broken that piece up. We've got also just funny enough, like the, like the Eagle, we have the cheekbone and the brow ridge that are on top of it in a lower density piece on top of the back of the skull. 
then even with these weird shapes that we're dealing with in this kind of graphical tattoo style wing, we're going to go ahead and do that same process mostly, but with much more rough edges with a lot more abandon to the style. And certainly we did use a little bit of fill up in the top. That ridge at the top really does kind of define that edge very well. We've got some pretty rough outlining here. And then again, we're going to go ahead and add some detailed texture into it as well as that thicker border. Now, this was also going on a thick uh, Carhartt style hoodie. So we were seeing some loss out in this edge. It was sucking that thread down quite a bit. So that's why we have kind of a really fat edge on it. Also, there was not much reveal on the original art here in the text and these were rough. So I allowed it to kind of uh, feather in and cover a fair amount of that um, a fair amount of that wing of that feather tip as well. So that was another thing, just interesting to show that. Also super graphical pieces. If you haven't seen me talk about this before, this was a piece that was being rendered as for a local high school where they had originally had some pieces rendered entirely as flat fills, but they really liked this other look. And I can actually show you, uh, we'll go ahead and show you the actual piece because we can do that. Um, I've got the pictures ahead of here. First, I'll go ahead and show you guys this is the real wing tip of that knob hill piece. And this is actually to show you folks uh, the pull and the push. See how I've stopped short here, stopped short before this border and I have extra pull on it. Especially a lot of these were going over mesh on some of the caps. So you had to have extra compensation. You can see on the actual piece as taking this photo, we've got a pretty good edge on it and we're not going over that edge. So yeah, cutting those points, that is actually, a, that's a technique for dealing with push compensation, especially on hats where you got a little more shifting, that's the case. But this particular piece I was gonna show you once again, this is a very graphical style, completely, uh, completely graphic. There's nothing realistic about it where we have this winged lion with the sword and these carved wings actually ended up being a feature that was uh, kind of critical to the account. They really loved this piece and we have both carving in the face and in the wings. But the wing, even being graphical like this, you can still kind of see that I've used the same biology to inform me of how I'm gonna do this. I only used one big primary feather for each of these pieces and then this ridge here that goes into the final flight feather. But that's the thing, even though these lines aren't present in the original art, you can still see how we get this kind of great texture out of it. We get this wing texture. We have a difference between the texture and the body, which is done with curved fills uh, in comparison to having these carved wing pieces. So, you know, I think that that's interesting in and of itself. But if we look at that in, uh, you know, in the software, which we can do, uh, certainly you can see that this is a little different in the execution, but what I have done is I've used a global underlay on the entire piece so that I could use much lighter textures overall. And then I don't have a lot of underlay in the underlying, in the overlying pieces that are related to it. So what I ended up with is a global underlay because I was dealing with some heavy and some textured materials. Uh, once the global underlay is done, I'm carving without doing a bunch of individual underlay, even though I use things like uh, link limit stitches that have some penetration points in the center that may show some color. Uh, I'm not going through those. I'm just going over them with very minimal uh, contour underlay on the edges just to kind of separate those edges and keep them from feathering entirely into each other. But as you can see, that wing is still constructed in a very similar manner where we have some overlapping satins with that frontal ridge, that kind of shoulder that we have on the wing, that leading edge that I think gives it a lot of detail. And the same thing happens even in very small pieces. This is actually from a visor. So we're at sub one inch here. We have a sandhill crane. So it's very abstract, right? It has to be abstracted. We're trying to find out what are the things that are essential to making this look like a crane? Well, we have the two feet in the position they're coming down. We have the wing tips and the overall silhouette. The beak has to have a certain shape and the red kind of eye patch, the spot that's on the side of the face have to be there. But as you can see, these little bitty feathers, uh, same kind of technique to get some texture. The body also has a lot of satins in it, but then there's the neck. There is the main body though, has that same randomized fill texture. And then we have the little flight feathers and a secondary round of feathers with the, the leading edge again. Only difference being because of the coloration of this bird, the wing tips are dark. And so I actually, mixed those into the color change for the final piece. So that color change on the last piece has this super dark gray uh, charcoal. And as you can see, as it's rendered at an inch tall, uh, the details certainly meld in together somewhat, but we still get the concept of the wing without having to have these clunky outlines on the feathers. We're just getting the small amount of texture to help us figure it out. And the same thing, once again, we're gonna talk about graphical pieces that don't have a super realistic look, you're still seeing the same kind of structures being drawn in them. And here is a track and field, classic winged foot for track and field. 
I'll go ahead and run that through construction. First thing you'll notice is that the second wing, this is supposed to have a wing on either side of the ankle. The portion of the second wing that's furthest away from us on the other side of the foot runs first so that it's at the back of that layering. So we have that and then we have the um, length limited satin foot. Then we come back in and you can see we've got our flight feathers done. In this case, I went ahead and did the secondaries also as the satins because we've got those outlines that are going to outline all of those different shapes. You have kind of the instep. We have also these kind of little belts, the sandal. Uh, so we have the belts of the sandal as well being kind of shown as part of that carving. So when we look at that, we can see that we have these individually carved pieces in the satin stitches and uh, contrasting the texture of the body of the foot very similar structures all, all told. So it's something to, to look forward to. Uh, same thing for this particular piece. And I actually have a, a photo of this piece. Uh, the shading looks a little rough here because the uh, colors aren't coming off quite as much as you might hope for that piece. But um, if you look at that article from Images Magazine, you actually get a chance to see that piece in that one as well. We can zoom in on that and see this is what the actual piece looks like on the cap. And this is on a structured you know, six panel, uh, I would say this is actually a, a high profile cap. It's a fairly high profile overall, but this particular piece, we have also similar structure being done in the Sand Hill crane on this one. So we run through the text and that's all there. But once we get there, you can see the rear wing is done first. So it's underneath the body. We've got that back leg there. Once again, that body has a, a randomized texture in it, in the fill. And then we're gonna go ahead and hit flight feathers, secondaries. Once we get to the tertiary feathers, I'm doing another curved fill with that uh, organic texture on it. And then we have the ridges. And again, we've got some minimal shading, but when the colors are a little closer together, these are showing a little bit too contrasty. Uh, when the colors are a bit closer together, that minimal shading really doesn't uh, look quite so sketchy, quite so liney as this piece does. Uh, same kind of stuff. Like I said, we'll go very briefly. Uh, Navy SEALs logo, same thing, super graphical, but it's done in much the same way. We've got these uh, lovely little pieces of carved satin leading edge, the neck and the head go last. Same kind of thing, except for in this particular piece, the um, the rest of the icon is going to be running on top of it because this uh, anchor and the pistol are in front of the eagle in this particular piece. Even with horrific, ugly art, this art was terrible, but uh, I did try and give it a little bit of texture because this is this Hawks football piece. Uh, once again, really rough art. The art is not giving us much but what we can do is give it a little bit back by adding those flight feathers, carving those out. And it means that our big slab of black here now takes on some texture. Um, not everybody's gonna want this for every, uh, every logo, every mascot, but frequently I've had it uh, be kind of the differentiator between my work and somebody else's work. My, mine is not nearly uh, as likely to be flat fills. And even when we're dealing with badges, and now these are the ugliest badges. This is one of my least favorite ones. It has what we used to uh, colloquially call the turkey eagle. Because up on this top, you can see the head of this eagle is awful. It looks like a little puff ball in the center. However, even though we're dealing with the turkey eagle, which is not a particularly attractive eagle, and uh, despite my best efforts to recommend an outline on the inside of this, they did not want it. It didn't match their original uh, pieces that they were working from. They did allow me, however, to carve once again, the wings. So we've got the rest of the badge filled in and actually you'll see that there's carving. If I back out a little bit, there's carving in these uh, kind of laurels, these little stalks that are in here, the leaves or wheat, whatever you want to say that is. Uh, we have that carving there certainly. And then we have that same kind of carved aspect with those feathers in the top of that badge as well. And it does offset it in the real piece quite a bit better than just flat. And certainly you have uh, variations like this that are once again, really graphical outlined. And this one happens to have the, uh, the big proud eagle head. Once again, strange ways of handling that badge. The full color eagle head is not what I expected <laughs> to, to see with most of these. But if we scroll up to the top of this, the winglets, just like we have, we've got some carving in the rays and everything down here too. Uh, and certainly in the laurels and the wreath around the side. But when we get up to the wings, these little kind of separated wings, these are uh, definitely going to be able to flip from one side to the other, uh, aside from a little bit of difference that's in, in this particular piece because of the shape, as you can see, of the eagle head that's filled. 
uh, these are very similar on both sides and we end up with only just a little bit of alteration that has to be done on both sides necessarily. Most of them are gonna be uniform, but some of them aren't. This one actually does have a, a little bit in here that's not uniform. But on some of these, like the turkey vulture here that we have, uh, they are identical side to side. This one actually does not have those. But you can see on uh, the La Cueva one here, it's mostly aside from the fact that the head carves in. And I'll say sometimes I'll copy portions and then edit out the pieces that are not. So that's that's wings. I mean, if we really want to get to it, the simplest versions of these guys, uh, I would say, are really still show the ability of what you can do by doing a little bit of carving. Um, if I go back to some of my earliest stuff, like I said, not this stuff. I don't like the flats. But if we go back to these original little wings, the very first ones I did, this is a similar technique to what I'm doing now. Uh, certainly, these are a lot rougher. And you can see I was using the software that didn't have that accurate curve. So all these are made out of these straight line sections, as you may have seen me discuss before. So you have all these straight line sections that aren't very attractive. But what I'm going to say is it's still a fairly effective look to have the carving, a little bit of textural variation here, and then that leading edge. So I think those that's interesting in and of itself. Uh, I think that you can certainly go with more. And like I said, check out the other things that are in the uh, documentation that we have in the links list. And you'll see uh, certainly much more detailed discussion of how to handle texture and what we do with stitch angles and, and the like. But you can see on the actual piece that we have things like when we're looking at this piece, that's one color of gold, but there's this distinct shading, there's shines, there's highlights, and, and there's shadows that are born out of using those carving methods. Uh, we get a little more detail. And this piece is a little more washed out because of the selection for the colors that eventually happen there. But even on this piece, with generally one color in the bird aside from the shading, we're getting a highlight on the back of the neck. We're getting a shadow on the inside due to the satin stitch carving. And I think it's useful. Here we have some shadows inside the wing that I think are attractive. Uh, and honestly, throughout you get, I would consider that to be a better textural look overall than if you don't use any sort of carving at all. Now, can you do it without the carving? Absolutely. Like I showed you earlier, wings often can be done that way. You have big flat fill wings. And uh, it's not that those are necessarily lesser. I just think most of the time when I'm dealing with badges, um, what people are looking for, and in fact, they will often think of as a function of it being metallic, They'll want to use metallic threads maybe, and sometimes that's cool. They're actually looking for the faceted look of the badge, the faceted look of the metal piece. Uh, frequently enough when we're dealing with things like police badges, when I've had issues with them not liking the overall texture, what it often is is that the flat fill, if they've brought something to me that's super flat, it doesn't have the look of the badge and the ba because the badge is molded. And if we use these little pieces of uh, satin stitch, we can often get kind of a more sculptural look, a more relief look to it. And when we're dealing with wings like this, uh, carving them uh, with those pieces, having those, especially the flight feathers, the primary feathers along the edge carved out can really give them a, a little bit more lively look. I've got a couple uh, last comments here that I'll bring up. Uh, one last comment. Uh, Candy says, a randomization that was new embroidery stitch turned to me. I found it in my software. Woohoo. Yeah. Uh, random length on fills. Uh, if you haven't seen me talk about texture, it's something I'm going to be teaching at DAX this year as well. Um, I think that just using that randomization can give you a much more organic look to your fills. Otherwise, traditional tatami fills have a tendency to look very smooth, which is, the necess is necessary. It's what we need. We want them to look smooth. When we're trying to do something that looks mechanical or flat or machined or milled, we want a very smooth texture. And, and when we're talking about stitches, we're lining up individual stitches. They will always be stitches. Um, the way to get a big field of smooth things is to have a pattern that is regular, and the regular pattern is, is red by our eyes is smooth. Even if we have the same number of penetrations in the pattern when it's random, uh, the fact that it's random will make it look more organic. So yeah, randomization, especially like if you're gonna use any sort of fill inside of the wing. And I would say up in those tertiary feathers where we have that kind of fuzzy look, especially if we were to look at photographs of an eagle feather or an eagle wing or a raptor wing, you're going to see that we have these very defined feathers on the edge. And as we get up into that inner area, we're usually going to have some fuzzy feathers that are not as well defined. And so that's one of those things that, you know, may be worth looking at using a more organic fill, especially if we're going to outline on top of it, we're going to throw text on top of it, we're going to put other detail on top of it. Um, dealing with that as a fill may allow us to have a little bit more solid base where we don't have, say, interactions between the angle of the satin. Because if the angle of the satin underneath 
uh, a satin stitch ladder and we don't have a lot of underlay holding it up, we're going to get that sinking. It's going to want to sink together. The top satin will just want to pull right down into that um, like angle. So we'd have to be very careful about our stitch angles, about how our underlay is done. And even then we might not like that interaction. Whereas if we do have something like that fill that's textured and we're careful with our fill angle, we might actually be able to get a better chance at it not wanting to sink in or getting say ragged edges, stuff like that. All right, folks, uh, with that, we are kind of technically into overtime here. We're getting into our bonus time, but I think that should be it for today. If you have a topic you'd like to see me cover next week, by all means, uh, get into the comments. Let me know. Contact me on social media and we'll talk about it. Uh, hopefully that was useful to you. And for the couple of folks who wanted to ask about kind of building up a graphical wing, well, that's how I do it. And hopefully the other things that came through that were interesting should have brought you some other understandings of how you may want to approach your art. Uh, look at the art you have. Look at the styles that are being represented. Uh, when someone gives you examples, certainly go back and check with them to see what's the most important thing for each piece. However, uh, look at what's available out there if your art is not of the, the highest quality. Take a look at the compromises that were made by other embroiderers. If you're given an embroidered sample and original art, and you can see where the thought process sometimes is really about the technical nature of the thing. And uh, by all means, I would say think about texture, think about what you can do with your stitches. And frequently on those pieces, they look really intense, but the stitch counts are sometimes less than if you would have just filled the whole uh, wing. And the other thing I'm going to say, as we saw in the one example where I showed you that filled wing, it's entirely filled. When we have that kind of um, bumpy edge, that edge with lots of little inset cuts the way you have on a wing, using a standard fill for that, you're going to see a tremendous amount of travel. Uh, there's going to be a lot of travel underneath it. There's going to be some issues with the fill lapping on itself. And sometimes those can actually show up in texture. When there's a ton of it, you may see that the processing really travels a lot in your fills anyway. So breaking that up also lets you have uh, a more organic and more sensible pathing as well. All right. So with that, folks, uh, I'm going to let that be the end of the take up for this week. Uh, we may not be super technical this next week, but I'd love to know what you want to talk about. I know I've got some topics people want me to cover. And uh, certainly I'm going to revisit some stuff that are uh, old standards as well as going to some new cool stuff as we get there. And it may or may not all be digitizing. But if that's what you want to see, by all means, let me know. If you've got things you're working on that are difficult for you, if you have questions about uh, trying to get projects done, if you have questions about a particular kind of embroidery, a particular kind of art, uh, I am here for that. All right, then with that, uh, I cannot wait to see you again next week.